Hi, this is Dr. Fred DePiro, and this video is an introduction to a new course being developed at Cal Poly called CPE 327-367. It's lecture and lab, and it's on signals and systems, specifically for computer engineering majors. This uh, course with lab provides a shorter path uh, in order to prepare you for DSP-related careers. I'm an electrical engineering professor and a good friend of the computer engineering program, soon to be the computer engineering department. So, what's this course about? Um, signals and systems, in a word, in a phrase, yeah. Uh, in this case, though, the signals are discrete in time. A sequence of numbers. Uh, we refer to them as samples. Uh, this is different than other signals and systems courses that involve continuous time signals, such as voltages and currents. So our signals are discrete, sequence of numbers. Our systems are also different than you would have for a continuous time uh, implementation. Uh, rather than RLC op amp type circuits, instead of that, uh, we're going to have computational types of systems. So CPE 327-367 is a disc discrete time signals and systems course. Here you see an illustration of a sinusoid that's been sampled uh, with many samples per period. Okay, So that's the type of signal we're talking about. Stream of numbers. Now, why are discrete time systems important? These kinds of systems enable many applications that cannot be implemented using continuous time systems like op amps. Okay? Uh, and in some cases, they provide a better uh, type of implementation. Let's see here. Some applications. Uh, compression and streaming types of applications. MP3, audio, video. Okay? Lots of different kinds of compression standards out there. Discrete time, no problem. Continuous time, we got a big red X here, good people. No way, you can't do it. Okay? Another application, uh, voice recognition. Hey Google, synthesis, uh, vision-based navigation, discrete time, yes. Continuous time, no. You're not gonna drive me around the block, okay, with an op-amp circuit. Not gonna happen, okay? Control systems, like uh, the cruise control for your car. Um, these can be implemented either in discrete time or in continuous time. Uh, older cruise control systems in cars probably were implemented with op amps. Now they're done in microcontrollers. Um, but uh, for more sophisticated kinds of control systems like uh, six axis uh, control for uh, planes, uh, three uh, positional velocities and three orientation velocities. It, typically that would be done uh, with a discrete time implementation. The algorithms can be more sophisticated. Robotics is another example. Uh, it's all going to be done uh, typically in uh, with a discrete time sort of implementation. Think microcontroller, for example. So that's an example. Uh, this is an area where you can do control either in discrete time or in continuous time. Discrete time is a little bit more sophisticated, gives you some more capabilities. Uh, similarly here for communication systems. So continuous time, you'd be limited to ye old AM and FM. Okay, works just fine there, okay? but uh, those are rather old school uh, compared to cell phone technology. And the reason cell is um, uh, more advanced is because uh, if you, within a local uh, cell area, you have multiple users transmitting on the exact same radio frequency. So, but you don't hear the other callers, okay? So uh, the only way you can do that is through uh, what we call digital modulation schemes that are enabled by discrete time signals and systems, okay? Makes for more efficient use of the RF spectrum because you're just, everybody's transmitting in the same uh, uh, frequency band, okay? Uh, so now, what do these what do systems look like in general? Okay, so I'm throwing this out there. I'm going to walk you through this here just for just for fun. Okay, uh, you don't need to take away all the details in this. Uh, we have a course in EE302 -E that's an introduction to uh, 
control systems in continuous time, you would learn about systems like this in great detail. Uh, this is referred to as a feedback control system. Okay? And this one uh, here, I'll talk about cruise control for your car. Okay, so you don't need to uh, get every detail out of this. I'm just trying to give you sort of the big picture and then we'll talk about the takeaways. All right, so let's see here. Uh, here's your car. Okay, and our goal is to control speed. So that's the actual speed, the physical motion of the car. That's what's represented by this arrow off to the right. That's the final output. Now we want to control that. So we're going to tap off of that. We could think of that as a signal, even though it's a physical motion. Uh, we're going to run that through a sensor here. That's going to give us an electrical signal. So this speed signal here, think of a continuous time implementation. So this is like a voltage. Okay? It's a voltage proportional to the speed of the car to the quantity that we want to control. Okay, so we're going to feed that back uh, to the left hand side. Let's see what happens. First thing we're going to do is we're going to negate it. So we're going to multiply by negative one. Then uh, let's see, what do we have coming into this summer here? Uh, we have our desired speed signal. Okay, so let's say we want to go 50 miles an hour. That signal is coming in here. Effectively, what this summer is doing with the negation is to subtract. So we get a speed error signal at the output of that summer. Let's follow this upper path. The speed error signal gets fed into all three of these subsystem blocks. Let's follow the top path to get us started. So that, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, speed error signal, <coughs> We'll edit that. That speed error signal is going to get uh, multiplied. Okay, there's going to be a gain factor here uh, that the controller, uh, control systems engineer would design into it. Okay, we're going to multiply that speed error signal by some factor, and then it's going to make its way uh, through this summer to push down on the accelerator pedal, as you will have all experienced if you've driven a car. I'm assuming you've all driven a car with uh, the cruise control active. It literally pushes down on the pedal for you, makes the car go faster. So if, uh, let's say for example, uh, we were going 50 miles an hour or we wanted to go 50 miles an hour, our actual speed was a hey, pretty close to that. And then we hit a hill, we encounter a hill. Okay. Well, the actual speed would drop. Uh, this system is going to detect now that there's a speed error. Perhaps we give that some gain and ultimately the pedal gets pushed on. The car accelerates, goes up to the speed that we want. Uh, we sense that and then we don't have an additional speed error. Okay. Now, um, let's see what these other blocks might do for us here. Um, first one here, gain and integrator. Now it's common in control systems that you can have, uh, what we refer to as steady state error. So you want to go 50 miles an hour, but the thing's only going 48. Okay. It's a little off. Well, over time, let's see what would happen. We would have this speed error and over time, this integrator here, what would happen if we have a small signal coming in, but then we integrate it over time. Let's say it's a small positive signal. We integrate it over time. What's going to happen here? that intensity of that signal is going to go up. So with a small error that persists over time, we develop a larger signal here, which is going to press down on the pedal more. Okay. So putting an integrator in a system can help uh, reduce steady state error. In fact, we would need an integrator in this type of uh, system uh, in order to uh, give uh, the proper type of uh, response. So integrators are very useful. Uh, let's see what else uh, we have going on here. A differentiator also with a gain factor. Let's see. So let's see if uh, we were going, uh, say, 50 miles an hour and all of a sudden, okay, the speed limit uh, is raised. So we say, oh, great, okay, uh, let's put it at 60. So we click the controller up to 60 here. All of a sudden, we get a step increase in our speed error signal. Now, uh, what's a differentiator going to do? Let's see. There was a rapid change in the input to the differentiator. So that means the output of the differentiator would have an even larger value. Okay. Cause the differentiator is going to react to sudden changes. It's going to give you a large output value. Now, what typically is done here with these types of controllers is this gain on the differentiator, it's actually usually a negative value. 
And the reason is, if all of a sudden you have this step increase, uh, that might result in really stomping on the pedal and ultimately having a bit of overshoot. You might go a little too fast. Okay, so this block here uh, is very often set up in order to reduce the amount of gain. So this is sort of a negative value that comes into the summation here. Cut back on it a little bit uh, so that we don't overshoot uh, where we want to get to. Okay, so what you're seeing here, and I'm kind of backing off to the big picture now. Here's the car. We're trying to control the speed. We have a sensor here. All this stuff in here, in this part, all these blocks and summers, these would be referred to, you can think of it as the brain of the controller. And the particular style of controller that we have here has this uh, proportional control, proportional component, integral component, and differential component, and that's referred to as PID. Okay, PID type controller. So the brain of the controller is PID type. Now, uh, this type of uh, system could re could certainly be implemented with op amps. Okay, we can make integrators, differentiators, gain stages, summers, negation. Okay, all that stuff we can do with op amps. We could also do it with uh, in a computational means. And now I'm getting to one of the important takeaways from showing you what a system uh, might uh, include. Take a look at all these different op operations that we have here. They're all mathematical in nature. I bet you can think of another way that we can do math, right? Okay, we can do these in a computational fashion as well. Okay, so let's take a look at a discrete time system that is more computationally based, and this is an example of a digital filter. In the class, we would be looking at these extensively. Okay? Digital filters are very, very common building blocks in uh, uh, these types of applications, signals and systems applications. They're like one of the most core fundamental elements. And let's see what uh, would be going on in this digital filter. I'll walk you through it a little bit. Here's the input here. Now this is a sequence of numbers, X of N, okay? N is a discrete variable, okay? So there's a sequence of numbers that are streaming in. Here's the output. Okay, again, sequence of numbers. And what do we have going on in between here? There's a multiply. So the signal here, we're going to multiply by a factor of one half, and we're going to add to whatever's coming in from below. So we have multipliers, we have adders, and then we have this nifty little unit here. This is a delay unit. In the class, you'll learn why it's called referred to as uh, z to the minus one as a symbol. Okay, but this is a delay unit. So what it's going to do, since this, this is a stream of numbers coming in, uh, the output of this delay block would be the prior number okay, that came in uh, on, the time on the time instance prior. Okay? Now, um, this diagram does include some uh, abstractions. It's a certain, certain little bit of a higher level abstraction compared to, let's say, a digital logic uh, type of circuit diagram uh, or a state machine type of diagram. There would be more details. And however, this is common in signals and systems courses. We don't include all of the details just because we're trying to abstract away and get a feel for the big picture of the operation of the system. But some example of the details that are absent here, these individual signal lines, think of these as binary numbers. So you would actually have multiple bit lines here. And if you have a diagram that shows more details of a uh, control system like this, sometimes you'll see a little squiggle going across that line and a number like 8, 16, 32. That refers to the number of bit lines that are representing uh, that discrete time signal. Uh, so that's one aspect uh, that uh, where this is a bit of a higher level abstraction of what's actually implemented. Uh, another example that's a, a bit of a uh, abstraction is notice that the clocking associated with these delay units is absent. It's just assumed that they're all clocked together, but we usually leave that off with these signals and system uh, diagrams. Hope you don't find that too irritating. You'll get used to it as we go through the course. No worries. Okay. Now, okay, these are pretty cool systems here because, uh, first of all, they can be implemented with a wide variety of platforms. You can readily put all of this into a microcontroller. You can put it into a standard computer. 
running Python or a common uh, type of uh, computational tool, MATLAB, uh, to implement all of this. You can run it on a computer with a special type of processor referred to as a DSP processor, digital signal processing processor, okay? Rather than a standard uh, processor with standard laptop, something like that. Uh, by the way, DSP processors were first invented by Texas Instruments, TI, in the 1970s, and they were invented with a special computer architecture to implement these kinds of calculations. And this revolutionized uh, digital filters and made it more possible at that time to implement them in what we would call real time. That is, the output can keep up with the input as it's streaming in. And that does get a bit impressive when we start talking about video rates or nowadays we're touching on gigahertz uh, rates that numbers can come streaming into these. Okay? Audio rates, uh, 44 kilohertz, CD quality sound, that's easy stuff these days. But back in the 70s, it wasn't. So they created a custom processor, a custom arithmetic logic unit to enable these types of systems. I don't mean to digress. So <clears throat> my point is here, there's a variety of platforms that these can be implemented on. Uh, microcontroller, standard computer, you betcha. Uh, special uh, standard computer, standard processor, or special DSP processor. How about FPGA? I bet you're all over implementing things on an FPGA. You bet you can do this sort of thing in an FPGA, absolutely. Or you wanna go further, custom integrated circuit, okay? You might pull in an EE or two on the team in order to help you with that, okay? So, uh, this is a wide range of implementation platforms. The custom IC is probably going to be the fastest in general. FPGA also quick. Uh, standard computers are getting pretty fast, so uh, audio is no problem at all these days, real-time audio. And, you know, offline, pff, no problem. Uh, microcontroller would be about the uh, slowest of all these options, but very inexpensive. Okay? So you can see there's all kinds of trade-offs between these. And I'll, I'll point out another aspect of the trade-off too. Um, discrete time uh, systems and digital filters can change their behavior dynamically. Like imagine a low-pass filter that you press a button and it changes its cutoff. Changes its cutoff from 1K to 2K or whatever the heck else you want. Okay, you can do that easily uh, at the press of a button. You can do that by upgrading software. Okay, now that's harder to do with a custom IC, but all these other implementations are quite flexible. So there's a whole lot of possibilities. Flexible, uh, flexibility is, is uh, uh, very much uh, available to you and also uh, a wide range of platforms for implementing these discrete time systems. Okay, so why take uh, CPE 327-367? My goal is to help you be a stronger team contributor when working on discrete time systems. Let me explain that a little bit. EE study, communication theory, control theory, signal processing. However, it makes me cry, and I can say this because I'm a double E, okay? Typically, EEs don't um, study much programming, you know, and they often don't like it. I'm just going to say it, okay? CPEs, on the other hand, all over programming, computational systems in general, networking, I.O., computer architecture, you are all over the um, uh, necessary means to implement these types of systems. However, you tip, uh, and again, I'm, I'm holding back the tears, uh, CPEs typically don't study communication systems or, for example, control systems, okay? Um, now, up until now, your option had been to take EE-228. It's on signals and systems. It's a required course. Good stuff, okay? But that covers continuous time systems, okay? We have this new class now uh, where you just get, we just jump over that and go straight to discrete time. Previously, if you wanted to get to discrete time, you'd take 228, first class, and then you could take uh, EE-328 and 368, but that was an elective and most CPEs didn't take that course. That's, that's my face right there, that big sad face, okay? So what you can see is we had a bit of a gap, and that really was a shortfall in the career paths for CPEs. 
We had EEs that had all this wonderful theory about control signal processing, but typically don't like to program. You have CPEs who are all over computational systems, but typically didn't get the background in, uh, say, uh, digital system, these types of digital signals and systems, uh, computational systems, signal processing, all of those areas. This is like a gateway opening up uh, to all of those different areas. So we had a gap. Now we have a new opportunity for you. CPE 327, 367, that single discrete time systems course, you can get to it uh, straight out of circuits, for example. Okay, so in conclusion, good people, I want to see you in CPE 327, 367, okay? Now, I won't sugarcoat it. This is a brand new course. I'm developing it now. Uh, maybe a little bit bumpy at times. However, I am sure that I will have fun in this course, and I expect you will too, okay? I have an introduction also, uh, more of a general introduction to myself. You can check out a teaching and learning tool that I developed for circuits. It's called Kate. It generates random circuits. It shows you the step-by-step -step analysis, mesh, nodal, all that, step-by-step, -step, equation by equation, and uh, generates practice problems, and I use it uh, as a quizzing engine as well uh, when I teach circuits. Yourlearningcoach.com. Go there, click on Kate, begin, and then new and next. It'll take you right through an analysis. I mention this also because I'm presently working on a new system that is similar in the sense of generating random problems, showing you step-by-step -step analysis, giving you practice problems, and then I'll be using it with a quizzing engine that I've also, that I've developed. Okay, it's called Slate. This stands for, well, Kate was Circuits Analysis Tool for Education. This is Systems Linear Analysis Tool for Education. So been working on that uh, uh, seven days a week, you bet. Also for your amusement, here's another thing. Now this is, this, is, this is for more for fun, but check out this demonstration of a lecture video system. I call it PAT and uh, it integrates together learning resources directly in the lecture. Okay. This is a, a sample, a three minute sample lecture from circuits. Uh, check it out. Just click on this uh, note. It's, it's a uh, login dot your learning coach.com slash Pat underscore demo. Uh, take a look at that. Uh, it's pretty funny. I actually use Google voice recognition and voice synthesis technology, and that allows me to edit, uh, what I said in the video, unlike what's happening right here with this video. Okay. Uh, and sorry, that Pat doesn't work so well on a phone yet. Uh, that's another thing on my to-do list. Laptop or standard computer work well. Hey, good people. I want to see you in uh, 327. Hope you'll take the course. You take care and uh, be safe, be smart, and don't forget to vote. It's coming up really fast. Okay.